And with that, I would like us uh, to welcome our last presenter of the evening. Uh, our friend Max is going to be talking a little bit about how to incorporate networking into your games. Uh, again, another thing to potentially try out when it comes to uh, experimenting with uh, new features or tech for something like the upcoming Global Game Jam. So everybody, if we could give a round of applause to our friend Max for uh, walking us through a little bit of how to work with networking in our games. Hey, welcome to my talk. This is low-level network game programming demystified. It's not so bad. Here's a super quick about me slide. My name is Max Peepenbrink. Here's a link to my itch.io. I learned to program at a young age, making video game content, scripting languages, learning C, C++. Uh, it's a hobby for me. It's not my day job. Uh, I learned a lot from the Half-Life 1 and 2 modding scenes. Uh, I have a past life as an IT consultant, which helped a lot to build my networking foundational knowledge. And these days, I'm an enterprise software developer uh, for backend systems. That's enough about me. The target audience for this talk is basically anyone who wants to know anything about uh, networking and games or uh, some general systems concepts. The people that will get the most actionable usage out of this talk are going to be developers who like writing libraries and tools uh, or developers who just want to learn how to get kind of started with multiplayer networking stuff but maybe are intimidated by some of the lower networking stuff, which can be a thicket. It can be really confusing and slow you down if you don't know if you don't have a map of where to go next when you run into some concepts. Uh, so that's that's who this talk is for. Topics and scope. We're going to touch on three different kind of areas. We're going to do first a low-level primer. We're going to talk about the differences between TCP and UDP. We'll talk about what TCP IP is. Uh, we'll talk about some basic routing issues that can come up with network address translation. Uh, we're going to then on section two, we're going to make a super quick naive protocol on top of TCP. And we're going to then move on to just talking about sort of high-level topics and how to approach making a multiplayer game uh, and what that, that really means when you're working inside engines and tools and how to orient yourself. We're not going to be touching on some deeper topics like security, advanced topology issues, uh, diving into super specific differences between engines and networking libraries, uh, things like networking physics, uh, there's there's approaches for compression, uh, and then there's the whole nasty topic of creating your own reliability protocol with things like UDP, which is just a very deep topic we don't have time for. All right, so section one, a low-level primer. On the right here, we have a stack of concepts that all sort of depend on each other, top to bottom. Uh, at the very top, we have what we could call the high-level APIs, this might be your game logic interacting with a networking library um, or libraries that expect some kind of contract with a lower level system inside of an existing game engine. Um, and then below that, you'll see the low level kind of spans the operating system uh, and maybe code you've written inside of a game engine. And low level is a vague term, but it does just sort of mean all the low level bit and byte pushing. Uh, so it spans quite a bit here. And then at the very, very bottom of the stack, we have you're a network engineer. This is the lowest level of everything. And there are tools you can use to explore this area like Wireshark. Um, the Linux kernel exposes some of this stuff if you find some like tools in that domain to really go nuts. But in general, we don't need to think about stuff in the lowest level here. And we're just going to be focusing on the area highlighted in yellow, the game networking protocol piece of this. And what networking talk wouldn't be complete with a very quick overview of TCP versus UDP. The traits of TCP are that it's connection oriented, it's reliable, it's ordered, it's fault tolerant. You create the socket, you put, you send things, you receive things. It's going to happen in the correct order. Uh, nothing unexpected will happen. However, we don't have any control over the tuning. So if anything interrupts the connection and the message needs to be recommunicated, we don't really know that's happening. It's, it happens on its own, and we as developers just have to trust and wait for things to come back to us, uh, which is non-ideal for certain situations. Uh, 
Uh, the UDP traits are it's optimistic, it's fire and forget, and there's no guarantees. You're on your own. Um, so I tried to kind of explain this with diagrams. You can see in the top right, there's handshakes. Uh, you know, Alice calls Bob. Alice says, hey, Bob says hello. Uh, Alice now has confidence that they're actually talking to somebody so they can send some messages. And each message they send, they'll get a check to make sure that Bob received the message and same going the other direction. Um, and UDP is more like two auctioneers just shouting data at each other. And if there's interruptions or things are lost, uh, it depends on how the libraries are written around this. They can try to implement these conversations, these conversational flow mentioned in TCP above, but you have options. You can ignore certain types of messages. You can assume oh, I lost a positional update, but you know what? I'm going to be getting hundreds of those a second, so it's fine. Um, or maybe there's a remote procedure call you need to call, uh, and that's important. You don't want that to be missed. So you might send that message and expect that message to be acknowledged in some way. And then if it's never acknowledged, you might send it again, or you might invoke some kind of error case. That's the trade-off with UDP. You have to know what you're doing and why. Building off the last diagram, there are some requirements for any conversation to take place uh, for both UDP and TCP. There's some commonalities. Uh, we have a little diagram here on the right. So every conversation, every packet that goes out on the lower levels needs a to address to a port and needs to be from an IP address from a port. And this just helps every piece of the network keep track of how to route messages around. We don't need to think too hard about that, but I, it is useful to understand that that's happening. So for example, we have two machines on the network here. Uh, they both have different Ethernet zero addresses. One's a 192.168.0.1 and 0.2. So those can talk to each other using those IP addresses. Um, and I also wanted to call out some conventional things in operating systems that we have, such as if you're creating a TCP socket that listens on 0000, 000, 000, 000 that means it's listening for connections on all network adapters. So if you have a Wi-Fi, uh, if you have a Wi-Fi adapter and an Ethernet adapter, maybe multiple Ethernet adapters, you will create a socket that's listening for connections on all those adapters on a specific port. Uh, if you're listening on localhost, you will only be listening for other programs running on the same computer, because localhost is a special private address that programs can use to talk to each other locally. So let's get into what a TCP socket actually kind of functions like mechanically. So each TCP socket represents a one-to-one, point-to-point conversation. So every new conversation you need to have, say as a server, requires a new socket for every client connecting. Uh, you know, and in some cases that can turn into having a lot of TCP connections, like a web browser might create a lot of sockets to talk to a server and request image data and like style sheets and, and scripts simultaneously when loading a web page. And that all might go to the same server and all those connections will need a new socket. Um, when you're writing with TCP, when you're writing code with TCP, you have a listener socket on the server, which is listening on a port. And every time a client connects to the server on that port, the server will create a new socket. This flowchart on the right uh, tries to explain this. So the computer on the left tries to be the server here. It starts a TCP socket. It's listening uh, across all network adapters that it has on the 27015. And on the right, the maybe the player starts the game client, and that game client creates a TCP socket, and it connects to the IP address of the computer on the left on that port it's listening on. And an important note here is that in these kinds of connections, the from address from the client is often random. This The OS will will help pick a random port, or there'll be a little algorithm that tries to find an unused port, and it's often in these kinds of high numbers. You don't need to think about that basically ever. Um, so the server will receive that connection, handshake, and it will basically perform the handshake with the client. It'll say, hello, hi, hello. And now both sides of the connection have a socket object which represents this phone call. And both sides of this connection can send and receive data, and it will arrive in the order it was sent in. It'll arrive reliably and intact. Uh, everything will just work, so to speak. 
And you can imagine this is very convenient. This is super great for cases where you do not need to drop packets or worry about throughput as much for something like a real-time game. In general, I'm going to say if your game lets you use TCP for what it is, you should do it. You should use TCP. It's fantastic. Where you're going to have problems is if you have a real-time FPS or action combat game where reflexes matter, then if something happens on the network and there's some blips and communications need to reoccur, that reliability aspect, the ordering that's guaranteed, that happens on the operating system layer. So the OS is going to go out of its way to orchestrate the retransmission of these messages. And in, while that's happening, your game client is going to be sitting there not receiving any messages. So not ideal for a certain type of game. But you can imagine if you're making like a poker game or a card game or something turn-based, this is fantastic. Uh, we don't have to do anything at this point. We can just write our uh, game logic on top of this protocol and come up with some messages and everything will kind of happen in order. This is great. And if we contrast this to the UDP socket, uh, we're kind of in a different situation. What we have on this slide is a server on the left, client on the right, and this UDP socket the server creates, well actually you can keep using it for all the clients connecting to it. It's just a data sync as far as the topology is concerned here. So you could have five different clients sending data to the exact same server IP end port and that data will come out inside that server's code from that UDP socket. It'll just pull messages out of the queue and they'll have a from address and a from port and it's up to the networking library or whatever you've written to map those messages to game objects, to abstractions you may have built that represent that connection. So UDP is called connectionless for this reason. There is no handshake. There's nothing that happens. It's just you're listening on a port and messages come in with a from address and it's up to you to figure it out from there. There's no guarantees here. Messages could be lost and you wouldn't know it unless you go out of your way to implement systems to check you know, how many messages were sent recently and which IDs you received or didn't receive. And uh, depending on what you want to have happen, you can that could be fine, that could not be fine, it's up to you. So naturally, UDP is sort of the dragon that you're chasing with network programming. Uh, it is the best possible protocol for doing things like a real-time FPS game because a lot of state is self-healing. Like you could lose a few positional updates, but you're receiving hundreds a second, so it's fine. Um, but then you have to go out of your way to do all that work that TCP does for free, so to speak. Uh, and that's tricky. It's actually a very deep topic with lots of optimizations, and it's way too big for this talk. Uh, at the end of this talk, I'll have a slide with some references on some jumping off points if you want to dig into this topic more, because it is useful to learn how to write your own protocols uh, that do things like connection management. Okay, so that's a crash course in UDP and TCP uh, connection management. So now we're going to talk about NAT, Network Address Translation. And we're going to just keep this to one slide because this is a jumping off point for a lot of complex networking topics. But this is one that you will run into if you go down the path of making a networked game, whether that's peer-to-peer -peer or the internet, uh, you will run into this. The basic idea is that your internet service provider gives you uh, an address, and usually your router holds on to that address. And the router will will put up a facade to the internet. So all your devices are behind the router inside the local area network. And the router and those devices know each other by their local addresses. So the router has a public address and a private address, which is often like 192.168.0.1 or something. And in this example, we'll say that we have Bob's laptop on the right here. And it has the dot .20 address with, uh, maybe it made a TCP socket to some game server on the internet and that connection has to go through the router. So Bob's laptop here made a connection and the source port is 581086 and the source address is 192.168.0.20 and this connection to the game server has to go through the router. Uh, so Bob's laptop doesn't know about the 10.20.441 public address that our ISP gives us. That's just the router's responsibility. So the router is responsible for getting this message out there and it sees this connection being made and it goes, oh, uh, 
I'm going to be sending messages out to the internet with my public IP as the from address, and I need to come up with a fake port number that isn't in use on on the public side of this uh, to route back. So when messages come back to me uh, on this port, I know that they're part of this connection to Bob's laptop on this internal IP and internal port. So the router maintains this NAT table, this network address translation table. So it presents this facade of the internet and these ports map to your internal machines uh, and it does this automatically all the time but if you've ever tried to host a, like a Minecraft or a Counter-Strike server um, you've probably had to go into your router and create a forwarding address manually so that other clients can initiate this conversation and uh, only through those explicit port forwarding rules can a random internet address reach into your network to a specific machine. Uh, but if we're, if we're talking the other way around, the router will be creating those kinds of port forwarding rules automatically and letting them expire when the session dies, things like that. So given the things we're talking about here, you could hopefully see that this complicates peer-to-peer -peer communication because the incoming request for, say, like a 1v1 fighting game, uh, there's there's no way you're going to have every user who plays your game uh, go through and set up forwarding rules. Uh, and there's some solutions for this. There's things like UPnP, which is Universal Plug and Play. But the real solution is NAT punch through. And I cannot cover that in this talk, but that is what you need to understand and learn about to make a peer-to-peer -peer game. And it usually involves a protocol called STUN, S-T-U-N, that handles this. You have a common third-party server, both clients communicate to that server, which opens up the ports when they do that, and then the server uses, acts as a middleman here and uh, communicates those port openings to the other clients and so they can then get through to each other. Uh, but there's a lot of nuance here, there's a lot of weird stuff, and just be aware that that's an issue. All right, so now we're moving on to what we really are here for, which is Section two, let's make a very naive game protocol. And we're calling it naive because we're not dealing with a lot of issues. We're not gonna deal with security. We're actually gonna let clients send messages they maybe shouldn't. Uh, but honestly, a lot of times, I think people box themselves into making things more complicated than they need to. If you're making a game that you're only gonna play with your friends or in moderated environments, you can trust the client with a little bit of information. However, if you're making a competitive esports game, things change. You do need to put all that effort into managing security and what's executing where. All right, so let's say we have one week and we're going to make a little Bomberman game. Uh, I hope you all know Bomberman, but it's a simple 2D game where you move around, you place bombs, you erode the arena until you can start placing bombs and boxing each other in. Uh, it's great, it's fun, it's real time, and I think it's loosey-goosey enough that we can do it on TCP without stressing uh, some of the caveats we've talked about. The game requires a couple things. We It's round based. Uh, there's obviously multiple players. There's destructible blocks. We have bombs. We have this explosion effect. We have power-ups, which we're not going to do, but you could hopefully leave that up to your imagination. Uh, maybe some homework for how to do that. So let's break down what I see as the bare minimum for getting this kind of game working. The server needs a way to say that we're spawning entities, uh, we need a way to destroy entities. We need a way to use IDs that is common across all the connected clients and on the server so that everyone is using the same IDs to talk about the same objects. Um, and we need a way to explode things and also a way for players to get knocked out. So on the right here we have sort of uh, chicken scratch notes here and with all these notes here I just came up with something off the, off the cuff here. So on the left column we have a description of what the message will represent uh, and the hex number is the byte we'll use to the value of the byte we'll use to represent this message and on the right we'll have the parameters of that message so every time this message is constructed these values are required and they need to be exactly this many bytes and this will be what we're sending and receiving on our TCP socket and at the bottom here is a special type of message called assign authority. And this is touching on an important concept in replication frameworks and networking, where the server is going to say spawn an entity and it's gonna send that message to all the connected players. And it's gonna spawn an entity, entity number five, and that's a player. Uh, 
and it's going to send a private message to one player and say, hey, Entity 5 is yours. You own this object. And messages that are coming from a connection where we know we've assigned them an object, we can route those updates to that object uh, on the server side or discard updates for entities that connections should have no authority over. The top level responsibilities are pretty straightforward here. We just have to inform the players of the initial state of the scene. So if there's a game in progress or uh, we've arranged things in a certain way, we'll just do a full state update when they first connect. And as things progress, we'll be informing them of changes and updates to everything. Uh, one big simplification we're going to do for this is have the base design of the level stay the same. Uh, kind of shown in this diagram here, uh, which is nice because we don't have to send a bunch of extra level data as well if we just assume that it's static for now. We've got kind of a general architecture flow here where the server starts up and it creates a TCP listener socket. Um, normally the listener socket needs to be on its own thread, so this can be a little interesting if you're new to threading, but basically you'll have the listener running on its own thread and as new players connect it'll it'll wrap that socket that gets created for that connection in some kind of player connection abstraction and pass it back to the main thread. Uh, this can be a little bit dependent on what TCP library you're interacting with because ideally it's non-blocking and you can check to see if there's data to receive and how much you can receive uh, but you might be in a in a case where the receive call to the TCP socket to get data out actually blocks and waits for data to come in, which can be tricky. So you might have to do some asynchronous threading stuff to get around that. But ideally, you can just do everything on the main thread because these messages are relatively cheap for such a small game. So programming-wise, the actual goals are pretty straightforward, although it quickly gets convoluted the more complex your game and networking needs. But in our case, uh, we're just going to pretend that we've deserialized the messages and they have some kind of class where you can call get type and it returns the integer or byte representing that message type from the, ta the table we saw earlier. Um, and the idea is basically before the frame runs, or even after, it doesn't matter, but at some point in your game loop, we'll flush all the messages that are incoming, both as a server and a client and we'll just map those messages to some kind of handler and do the necessary action. So in the top here, uh, we, we for loop all the incoming messages for this frame. We get the type, we match it to these little jumps and uh, call, method, call methods with that. Uh, in this example, we run the game frame. And after the frame is run, we have some kind of assumption that we've built our networking layers at a higher level in such a way that when entities perform updates, they know that they have changed their state and that state needs to be propagated. So we loop through all the entities. If we're a server, if they have updates, we'll ask that entity to render those updates as byte payloads. This is probably not the best contract, but I think it's simple for this example. And then we'll broadcast those updates to all the clients. Uh, if the loop is running as a client, and it's the entity we have authority of over, we're going to send our just our updates for just our entity to the server. Um, so looking at our responsibilities on the left here, we have to process all the messages and apply them. We have to run a game frame at some point, and we also need to notice that state has changed and we need to send things to all the clients or back up to the server. And another little note is that as a client, we probably want to ignore incoming messages for the entity we control because otherwise we're going to be receiving old state. We'll be sending the server position updates as we move around locally and then those will come back to us, you know, 50, 100 milliseconds later. We don't want to apply them and cause our local client to jitter around. Uh, so we, we can throw those away for our simple example here. This talk is running a little long, so we're going to wrap this up. This is section three, uh, which is really just wrapping things up and going over all the kinds of pieces we've learned and where to look next. So the things we've done so far, we've scoped our needs. We've made sure that the complexity of what we've programmed is not too much. We've thought about the fact that this is a simple, light and playful game where we don't need to think about anti-cheat or super complex uh, hiding of information or anything like that. 
We've drafted a byte-level network protocol and came up with some messages required for the initial simple design. And we pseudocoded the event pump that will both take incoming messages, apply them to the game state, and come up with a simple contract for generating outgoing messages, whether that's as a server broadcasting things to all clients or as a client just sending things to the server. And then there's the things we didn't really get to. Uh, I really skimmed over the actual serialization and deserialization of messages on a byte level. There's a lot of frameworks out there that help you do this. We have like Google Protobuf, we have Cap'n Proto. I honestly don't think doing it yourself is that brutal, especially because it can kind of encourage you not to go nuts creating message types that you don't need. Um, depending what language you're working in, bytes can be easier or worse to work with. Um, we didn't get into advanced replication features, which kind of blends in with the next point, which is like designing a high-level API. Uh, these are things that, say, Unreal does really well for you. Um, there are frameworks in Unity that help you do this, like Proton, and and I know that Unity's first-party network offerings have always been in flux, and that the traditional Unity networking is pretty crappy in my experience. I've used it successfully, but I didn't love it. Um, the goal of like a nice built-in engine replication framework is that you don't have to do all this stuff. You just understand the high-level API and trust that all these kinds of decisions that I'm explaining in this talk are thought out for you. There can be different trade-offs for engines, like some things aren't going to, you're not going to want to make an MMO in Unreal, for example, without getting into the nitty-gritty and optimizing things on a really low level. Um, but once you master these kind of low-level concepts, it gets a lot easier to navigate the features of existing frameworks and engines. And knowing like, oh, you know what, I can just go make my own message type. I can, I understand what the example code is doing for the existing message types, and I can just make my own. Like that can be really freeing. Uh, another thing I really glossed over is that most protocols really need to have a good RPC framework, a remote procedural call, which is basically just calling a function on the other side of the connection. A lot of times this could be like a server sending a RPC call that invokes a method that shows text on the client screen, like a server announcement, or it plays a sound, or uh, you could use it just to send messages to the server for all the user inputs you're creating. And whatever it is, uh, the more generalized that is, the better. And in our case, we made a bunch of message types that could honestly be rolled up into one sort of generalized RPC system uh, so that there's less message types. But that gets into kind of the high, higher level stuff, which isn't the focus of this talk. But the big takeaway for me that I want to impose is that like a lot of this stuff is pretty approachable, uh, at least in a sense that you could throw it together for a jam. You might not want to jump into being a low-level network programmer as a career if you haven't done it before and gotten into all the nitty-gritty, but I think you can have a lot of fun with it for jams or for personal projects and really go wild experimenting and not getting hung up on huge complicated frameworks that might slow you down. Um, the big thing to take away is that nothing happens that you don't communicate. <laughs> nothing will get done unless you explain it to the clients and to the server. And so if you, you could think of it as like the server is some kind of telephone operator or and you're playing, I don't know, D and D over the phone and you just it's a, it's a very small band of information and you have to communicate every little thing that's happening. Like if I'm moving someone's piece on the board, I need to tell them that and everyone needs to listen. And the only other huge topic that I really haven't talked anything about are concepts like rollback and latency compensation, which are different things, but accomplishing similar goals. And this topic would also take another 30 minutes to really go down the hole of, but the general idea is that there's a lot of smoke and mirrors to make networked games feel good, even though behind the scenes there's 150, 200 milliseconds of lag in the worst cases. And even 50 milliseconds can be a huge deal. Like, what? how do you win, how do you resolve a race where two players shot each other at the same time and their clients at that moment in time in real life saw that headshot connecting or something? Uh, there's a lot of different ways to approach that, and that's the rollback and latency compensation topic. In fighting games, you have things like GGPO. In FPS games, we have a long history of keeping track of 
previous states of the game and actually like comparing the state in the past for when an important event needs to be reconciled. Uh, or in a lot of cases, you have some blend depending on each type of event of like, we can just trust this or we can override this or we can escalate this to be a complicated resolution outcome. There's there's all sorts of ways to get into lag compensation and it's all extremely dependent on your game. So whenever you get mad at some games, quote, netcode, unquote, uh, it's probably a very delicate choice that the network engineers and programmers had to come up with based on the rules of the game and what kind of player experience they're balancing for. At the end here, we have some resources and further reading. Uh, this is a bit of a link dump. Uh, a lot of the stuff I'm regurgitating here just from my experience over the years, but I went diving on the internet for resources that seem modern and up to date. And this top link is really good. This GitHub link just has a ton of jumping off points for a ton of different topics and examples. Uh, same with the second link here. And then a really common person you'll see referred as Gaffer on games. He has a really good blog. Uh, he was a network engineer on Titanfall 2, and he really knows this stuff, and his site is just full of all sorts of topics on networking, and they're really good reads, and I highly recommend it. Uh, Valve's latency compensation link is really good if you can wrap your head around it. Um, and there's the Unreal Engine Primer also goes over a lot of client-server relationship stuff that I think is very thorough. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, everybody give Max a digital round of applause. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think it's it's interesting, you know, I'm I'm extremely basic, uh, I'm an extremely basic uh, programmer. And I think listening to your talk, it was uh, the the very beginning of it was extremely kind of like demystifying and accessible. It, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, thanks for all the graphs and, or the uh, the charts and everything like that. Um, and yeah, in the in the chat, it looks like a lot of people are uh, discussing different options, uh, talking about using Mirror and uh, uh, other tools to make this kind of stuff work. So yeah, um, as as Max recommended, um, maybe do not approach uh, doing your your first uh, TCIP game uh, or your your first multiplayer project ever when you do a game jam but i mean uh i would i would love to keep in touch with anybody uh in the chat right now who ends up using some of these techniques uh when they're making games uh for for global game jam or otherwise summer slow jams next year or any of those kinds of things